talking. If I start mumbling, just yell at me. I tend to do that sometimes. So <laughs> public speaking is not my favorite thing to do. I know that's hard to believe. But, yeah, I know. Um, it is about uh, interpersonal violence, domestic violence, and the capitalist system. Um, and the kind of my purpose in uh, organizing this was kind of to have people think about violence in a broader um, in a broader way, not just relating to like this is what happens, this is between two people, but to see it in a larger context and to see it um, with people who are marginalized and to think about ways to change it that aren't just like calling the cops or ignoring it, which is mostly what happens. So, um, this zine that I wrote that's over there on the table is basically what I'm going to go off of because it's kind of like my notes. So it's not perfect and I'm not an expert and I should have probably included something about self-defense and uh, interpersonal, interpersonal violence. I wish I didn't because I thought that would be a little too much for the game and it's but uh, this dean is also about uh, armed revolutionary struggle, especially in relation to gender. So you might want to read that too if you read mine, because I thought it was pretty good on that <coughs> self-defense type revolutionary struggle. I'm not a big like hippie that's like everyone sit down and hold hands or anything. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first part that I'd like to acknowledge is the causes of violence and how it's related to the way our society functions, um, specifically with social control and uh, kind of scapegoats having to do with the gender binary and class and other societal oppressions. So um, if we look at history of capitalist system, from the beginning with feudalism, war and other types of systematic violence and collective violence, which is groups, groups fighting other groups, right? Um, they always serve the interests of the landowners or the king, the church. It was always getting peasants and criminals and people who didn't have anything related to commit violence against other mostly landless peasants and people of that sort. And um, around the 11th century, uh, a lot of the peasants were having, peasants in Europe, sorry, were having conflicts within, um, within the feudal society that were starting to become a movement that, well, there were a few forms. Uh, there was the heretics movement, which was heavily influenced by protesting against the church and kind of saying like this crazy like indulgences and all this stuff isn't really working and things started to become more communal there was a lot of fighting for what's called the commons and that was like the land the peasants worked on and they were starting to claim that and this whole struggle for a more communal egalitarian society is what prompted basically uh, the, the movement towards capitalism the movement towards privatization of land the movement towards contractual labor, and it also sparked heavy violence against uh, workers and against women and other marginalized people in society. And um, this took a lot of different forms. Uh, first off, the landowners started passing a lot of laws that were based in social control. They started passing laws about marriage. They started making it so that only they had a say in who the, their peasants could marry. They started making it so that they could actually rape the peasant's wife before they got married. Things that were all based in controlling the bodies and the actions of peasants. And this continued with um, a lot of violence against peasant women was starting to take place as they moved towards uh, the 1400s, 1500s. Uh, there was mass rapes of peasant women in the street and it was kind of seen as this weird class warfare of them trying to take them back from the masters. But what ended up happening was just a lot of misogyny and dehumanization of poor women and also other women. And uh, at the same time, 
pro prostitution was legalized and a lot of these women who were being kicked off the land that was being privatized by the landowners, people were moving into the cities, uh, women at that time were still able to have property it, to some degree, they were still able to work, there were women working as masons in the cities and uh, as poverty became more of an issue as this land privatization really wasn't good for most of the peasants. So uh, they started having to turn to prostitution and other things that at the time were legal. As you move into the 1500s, there was more of a move to criminalize uh, the working class and women. And at the same time, this is when colonization started also. Um, there were laws passed, a lot of laws passed specifically targeted at violence directed at dehumanizing women and homosexuals and other gender marginalized people. Uh, that was homosexuality became a really big thing that the church focused on because after the Black Death, the population of workers was so decreased that the church started focusing on procreation as basically a forced role to put women into it became about producing more workers and that's why laws became made against contraception at this time against homosexual sex they were forcing people into prostitution and then suddenly after this became kind of accepted prostitution was like a way to deflect a lot of social uh social anger at the working class you know but um suddenly they started making this illegal too and they started uh making it illegal for women to have jobs outside the home. They started uh, doing all these torture things directed at women, started putting them in these very misogynistic roles of you have to stay at home, you cannot work, you cannot uh, be a legal entity. This is all around the 1500s leading up to the Inquisition and the witch crimes that uh, happened later. Um, so. Uh, and there was also a very, um, very intentioned um, persecution of the heretic movement and like women healers and people who had uh, knowledge that was traditional knowledge based in the peasantry. And this was something that uh, was very purposeful. It was meant to it was meant to take away knowledge and power from these people. Uh, with, with you see with colonization, uh, which started also at the same time as the witch hunts in Europe and this era, uh, we saw genocide, slavery. Um, we also saw these women being treated for production of more labor. And this was much more profitable for the European colonists than what was going on in Europe at the time. They started using these people to produce and rape became institutionalized against women of color. Uh, people who didn't fall into the gender roles prescribed by the Europeans. There were a lot of indigenous and African groups that practiced stuff that didn't go along with these gender ideas or the idea of sexuality. There was a lot of uh, transsexual priests in some African cultures. There was a lot of uh, di very different ideas of gender in indigenous cultures, and these people faced genocide or extreme punishment. Uh, lots of collective violence, systematic violence, systematic destroying of cultures based around this very strict social structure that had been put into place with the Inquisition, which hunts and these witch hunts continued into the, into the colonies as a way to enforce social control. And it was really nothing more than that. It was pure, mostly misogyny and also racism combined. And it was meant for social control, just as lynchings of slaves were meant for social control. And uh, that kind of violence was very heavily ingrained into society as a way of social control, basically. It was just a mechanism to keep people in fear, to keep the workers in fear, and to make people commit violence against each other. And just, there was everyone, you know, if everyone is oppressing each other, then they don't even have to do as much work to oppress the slaves or to oppress the indentured servants working with the slaves. So it really, it's, 
absolutely <coughs> collective violence is something that only benefits the landowners, basically. Um, there's also the issue of uh, rape culture and violent control in this society. Um, the scapegoating of women and the demonization of their femaleness and their reproduction and their sexuality led to all of these different laws and social ideas about controlling female sexuality and also a lot of silence around sexuality and that has only worked against like healthy sexual re sexual relations like um, So, I mean, this idea around sexuality revolved around a lot of control and punishment and rape. Basically, everyone who studies sexual violence is in agreement that it's more about control or like embarrassment, humili humiliation of someone to rape them. It's not about the sexualness for the most part. And these ideas of submission and domination of women and other people of anyone you're in a sexual relationship with is so deeply ingrained that that has caused a lot of violence to come out of that. Um, another aspect of violence in our culture that I don't think is as, as recognized usually in this, these discourses is where children fit in. And, and the society that forms through devaluing the domestic um, sphere as domestic became basically something that didn't matter. It was unpaid labor, it wasn't worth anything, despite the fact that it kept society running. Children are also part of that sphere. They see children as workers in training or as property, basically. You send the kids to school to teach them to be workers. The government has the ability to do basically whatever they want with children. The parents and you know this kind of authoritarian society has the idea that they can make children do whatever they want them to do that they don't have rights over their own lives and we see a lot of parents who think nothing about you know spanking their kid about punishing their kids in a way that you can't do to an adult without it obviously being a form of violence yet we do it to kids all the time whether it's dragging them away when they don't want to leave or tell, you know, yelling at them in ways that we never do to another adult. We do it all the time, and that's something that they internalize. And a lot of times, abuse against children is completely ignored, stuff that is obviously not okay. Children are experiencing violence, and their institutions that are supposed to protect them theoretically do absolutely nothing in that form. They're more likely to be punished for trying to speak out about something than to actually get kind of help when they're being mistreated. And, <laughs> and um, I mean, children who experience violence are more likely to perpetrate it or to be in violent or in abusive situations later in life. If you grow up watching someone abuse someone, you're likely to either take the role of the abuser or the abuse. That's what you learn. I mean, there's nothing hard to understand about that, in my opinion. Children, I've seen it with the kids I work with. I mean, you can see the way they learn violence from other kids, from other adults, and it shows them changes in their behavior over time. And obviously, those behaviors stick with us as we get older. Uh, especially when you see violence or punishment as a solution to something that you don't like. Um, so, where does interpersonal violence come into violent society? I think that it's obvious looking at the history and the current situation of our society that violence is something that's taught to all of us as a solution to dealing with social things that are threatening our control. If if there's a country that's threatening our control over resources, we attack them. If there's a group that's causing a threat to our resources or whatever, we attack them. If a person is call causing a threat to our control over a situation, we attack them. It's something that we've learned from violent society and we've projected onto our own personal relationships. 
and that's especially true with people who have been um, have been exposed to a lot of abuse. They're more likely to see violence as a solution. Um, and I think that we have to uh, we have to think about sexual politics and other oppression in this context as well, and how dehumanization of women and other minorities and systematic violence um, really it makes it a lot easier to perpetrate violence personally against those groups and to get away with it and for people to remain silent about it, for institutions to not care because those people aren't who are valued to them. Historically, uh, the most common crime for the death penalty before pr formal prisons were established was lynching of black men for being accused of or for raping or having relationships with white women. But at the same time, historically, we see that African American women were being raped basically systematically by white men, yet did they ever get hanged for it? I don't think so. You know, and it's obvious that these systems were only meant to persecute the people that they were already persecuting. They're not interested in protecting women of color or you know, anyone else that doesn't have power in society generally. So violence is all throughout our system, basically, and that is reflecting on the way we treat other people. Um, so what does interpersonal violence look like? Well, that makes up physical, emotional, and sexual violence. Um, so that could be hitting or assaulting someone, uh, threats, insults, intimidation, manipulation, humiliation, constantly blaming people for problems, uh, sexual violence, unwanted sexualized statements or acts, manipulating or pressuring people into sex, uh, or perpetrating sexual acts when someone's not able to or is not expressing consent, right? Um, so the CDC concluded that over 7 million Americans experienced intimate partner violence, assaults, and rapes in 2004, and over 1,500 people were killed due to internet, in, intimate partner violence that year. Obviously, there are a lot of faults in reporting. I don't know if any of y'all look at statistics on these things, but it's estimated that probably these numbers are at least twice as high because police don't really respond to these claims that a lot of issues and oftentimes the survivors are going to feel like no one's going to listen or that it compromises them in some other way, whether it be maybe they have a warrant out and don't want to go to the police, maybe they have other issues, it could be immigration status and anything. Um, according to the FBI, <laughs> There were 16,000 murders in the United States in 2004, and at least 94,000 rapes that were actually reported. So of those reported rapes and murders, a lot more of those could be between people who know each other well, and a lot more rapes than 94,000 actually probably occurred, which is very frightening. But, and that's just in the U.S., obviously. Um, <laughs> with sexual assault, Statistics from Huff Huffington Post stated that somewhere from one third to one and one in five cis women are raped in their life. One out of every 33 cis men, one out of 10 prisoners, uh, one out of three women in the military, and even higher percentages of non-binary and trans people experience sexual assault. There are an estimated 300,000 to 1.3 million rapes every year in the U.S. So basically what you should get out of that is if you know anyone, you probably know someone who's been assaulted sexually, probably otherwise too. That's, you know, at least one in every three to five people we know has experienced some kind of <coughs> abuse. That's a fucking lot of people, you know? And it's, it's amazing to me when I see people who don't seem to think about survivors of violence as people they know. It's just some statistic. And then someone will say something about their dad or 
something that happened to them in the past and they, they get these surprised looks on their face and I'm like, if it's one of the three people, don't you think that you know one of those people? So, I mean, this is personal to all of us and we have to think about it this way. This is people we know who are experiencing this violence. Um, and collective violence scale, millions of people die, obviously, every year due to armed conflict. Uh, the death penalty is one thing that I think is an insane show of collective violence against people. Uh, Texas has executed almost 500 people since 1976. We're at 493 right now. That's 500 people in the last 40 something years that the state has legally executed. Well, not legally in a lot of cases, but police violence killed one to two, one, or, one to two people per day in the U.S. last year. And targeted killings overseas have killed over 4,000 people. And that doesn't count thousands of people who have died in U.S. occupations. It goes without saying that our society is incredibly violent and this violence is affecting our, us personally in ways that we probably don't even realize it. And we're continuing to allow it to perpetuate in ways that we probably don't even think about on a daily basis. So what happens to the children who are learning violence in this way? Um, what happens to the people who are committing this type of violence? That's something that we should all be thinking about. Um, so the effects of abuse is another area that I'd like to just briefly go over. How am I on time? Y'all tell me if I'm talking too long, okay? Um, it can affect us in a lot of different ways. Um, there are things from obviously murder and suicide is the most serious effect of interpersonal violence. There's also severe emotional things like post-traumatic stress disorder that can severely limit how people are able to respond to trauma and function really in daily life. Um, common emotional effects of abuse are a sense of hopelessness, helplessness, or despair because the victim believes they will never escape the control of the abuser. Fear that one cannot protect oneself or one's children uh, and that they may fail to look for help from others or turn down help from others because they're afraid that they won't be protected. Um, a belief that one deserves the abuse or a belief that one is responsible for the abuse. Uh, flashbacks, recurrent thoughts and memories of violence and nightmares is a common part of a post-traumatic stress disorder. And emotional reactions to reminders of domestic violence or triggers, if you're at all familiar with that. Um, those are some of the emotional effects. There's obviously a lot of physical effects too. Um, sexual violence brings a lot of other um, factors in to be, um, I mean, you can look at the amount of unwanted pregnancies, spread of uh, infections and severe emotional traumas, even more so with sexual traumas than other traumas. Um, survivors of sexual assault are three times more likely to suffer from depression, six times more likely to suffer from PTSD, 13 more times more likely to abuse alcohol, 26 times more likely to abuse drugs, and four times more likely to contemplate suicide. So these are really serious things that are affecting people that we care about. Um, we have to also look at how uh, societal oppressions interact with violence. Uh, historically, marginalized people have uh, experienced the brunt of collective and systematic violence, and they also experience greater rates of interpersonal violence and are more frequently denied any kind of help or justice for their experiences. Um, We now see pr the prison system, police violence, and high rates of um, kind of assaults and attacks on people as uh, collective or systematic violence against people. Um, genocide and wars still continue to happen in colonized areas. 
uh, we continue to dehumanize uh, people of color and a lot of other people who are experienced the brunt of this violence and because of this they're more likely to be disregarded especially by power structures in society. Um, we see a lack of focus on mental health and rehabilitation issues, and we see laws such as SB 1070 that discourage immigrants from calling the police or seeking help in a lot of situations out of fear of deportation. We see poverty, fear of law enforcement, addiction, and lack of resources can be affecting different uh, marginalized groups to either be neglected or to fail to report or seek help after being abused. I found this quote as I was doing some research from the World Health Organization website. And it says, violence places a massive burden on national economies, costing countries billions of US dollars each year in, law, in healthcare, law enforcement, and lost productivity. And I thought this quote was interesting because it shows the interests of the power structures are, is this, economic to help these people? Is it economical to prevent violence? Is it economical to end violence? Like, they're worried about their freaking economy when we're talking about people's lives. And I was like, really, we're talking about economics and why it's you know, profitable to end violence. And so, you see, the police and society often are putting war funding, uh, prison funding over mostly drug crimes and theft and things that are, you know, pending doom issues. And, you know, social control measures like immigrant detention are put in front of funding education, abuse prevention programs, uh, putting funding into shelters for people who are seeking uh, an out, or mental health and rehabilitation programs for survivors or perpetrators looking for rehabilitation. These issues aren't being funded while we're funding war and immigrant detention and prisons. We put so much money into prisons, it's absurd. But prisons can't rehabilitate anyone when they're experiencing more violence in prison. I mean, that's not gonna rehabilitate people who already have violent tendencies. Okay. Um, so if we look at race and how this interacts, we see an overwhelming uh, lack of resources and apathy from police and government. We see that American Indian women are 10 times as likely to be murdered than other Americans and four times more likely to be sexually assaulted. And the problem that a lot of them run into with we saw this with the Violence Against Women Act is that tribal laws and tribal or the politics around tribal law doesn't allow or is basically the excuse for the government not to enforce things that are happening on reservations. And the same kind of trend is true with African Americans and uh, Hispanics and other minorities. Um, and we see higher rates of violence or systematic violence against these people still. We see that um, African Americans represent 26% of juvenile arrests, 44% of youth who are detained, 46% of the youth who are judicially waived to criminal court, and 58% of the youth admitted to state prisons. When you look at how much of society they make up, these numbers are insanely higher than they should be. We also see that still you have a much, much higher rate of being sentenced to death or charged with um, the sentence of death penalty if you are a person of color who has murdered a white person. Uh, Texas has carried out, well at this time, had carried out 470 executions and you could count on three fingers the number of executions that involved a white murderer and a black victim out of 470. Uh, that number is now 23 higher, and I, as far as I know, that, that statistic is still the same. And I've done a lot of work in the death penalty, so um, I mean, that's a vast, glaring, like, hello. Um, it's just insane to look at those kinds of statistics. Sexuality is another area that um, shows a big jump in how these how violence is dealt with. 
Um, a psychological study reported that 12% of gay cis men and 31% of gay cis women have experienced rape. And that, off, that about 10% of hate crimes against members of the LGBT community involve sexual assault. This has to do with the fact that sexual assault is often used to hum humiliate or punish people. Um, these high rates of abuse are also leading to higher rates of homelessness, oh. substance abuse, depression, suicide, and various other issues affecting these communities. The amount of queer kids on the street is much higher because of abuse, because people are leaving home because they're being abused and have a lot of issues that go with it, obviously. Um, gender identity and expression is another really, really important issue around violence. Uh, Non-binary and trans individuals continue to face alarmingly high rates of violence against them, especially trans women. I see in the statistics uh, here from National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, 87% uh, of anti-LGBTQ murder victims in 2011 were people of color. So you look at the way that race and trans status is um, working together, 87% were people of color. 45% um, of reported hate murders in, this year, in 2011 were tra transgender women. That's a hell of a lot more than it should be. And this was while representing only 10% of total violent survivors and victims. Okay, um, and these trends have gone up recently, actually, instead of down, as we would like to see. Uh, DC has the highest rate of uh, murder against trans individuals. And uh, an article I was reading about this, the author states that there's a mix of things uh, kind of revolving around this. It comes from um, rapid growing poverty, rapid gentrification, racism, uh, laws directed specifically at people of color, police brutality, failure of the legal system, and a lot of anti-sex work laws. All of these all combine with a backlash and stigmatization of the feminine, so misogyny basically, and they mix with this idea that uh, <coughs> when people who aren't necessarily born feminine express feminine, femininity that is reacted to very violently in general. And this is why transgender women seem to bear the brunt of this feminism because it seen as this femininity, femininity is seen as a threat, but it's even more of a threat when it's someone who shouldn't be expressing this, or it's someone who ex uh, causes a threat to the gender norms, gender binary. Um, in, in San Francisco, uh, approximately two-thirds of transgender women respondents had been incarcerated in one study. Um, and as activists estimated that there were at least 200 or an additional 1,000 gender variant inmates in the California prison system. This has a lot to do with the fact that uh, they're often not able to find regular employment. Uh, and a lot of people are forced out onto the streets. A lot of people are forced into sex work who are not uh, in line with gender norms. Um, about 68% of transgender women and 55% of trans men have been forced to have sex at least once. That is an insanely high number. Um, among transgender youth who are enrolled in school, almost 90% report feeling unsafe in school, and more than half report being physically assaulted, and 35% report being physically assaulted in school because of their gender expression. So we see that this is, you know, this is something that's not being being acknowledged so much, but it's very much there, and it's at much higher levels than it is for most people in society, for trans people. Um, so the last question here is, how do we fight violence in our own societies? How do we fight interpersonal violence? What do we do to unlearn this 
this violence that is all around us. I think the most, one of the most important steps is um, standing up to things that are outside of our own communities that are the bigger mass oppression, war, targeted killings, and fighting this idea that violence is a solution to anything. The more we kill people as a solution to something, the more kids learn this, the more it's normalized in our own minds. We can't, we can't just kind of go along with that anymore. Um, we also have to question the gender binary and uh, sexual, our way of thinking about sex, uh, redefine relationships and confront abusive behaviors and support the survivors of abuse. Uh, we, we need to encourage people to talk about these things and to act out and find solutions. Uh, and acknowledging mental health and oppression and the intersections of the, these things is also important for helping survivors and for trying to reform anyone who is portraying violence on others, or perpetrating violence on others. Uh, healthcare is really a big part of violence. There's not random violence in our society that's coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of, you know, one, learning violence, and two, a lot of mental health issues intersecting with that. I mean, violence is not random. Uh, we also have to acknowledge that just ostracizing perpetrators doesn't deal with all these other problems in our society. It just blames one person and forgets about everything else, and that doesn't solve the issues. Um, there's a zine called um, Betrayal, which I have with me if anyone wants to look at it later. But it talks about breaking the silence around this kind of culture and how important it is to not put limits on our solidarity not to refuse to speak out for an act for people who aren't necessarily like us or aren't our friends or you know maybe if it makes us uncomfortable we can't just not support someone we can't be silent we can't say oh i don't know anything about that because that continues to allow these things to exist around us ignoring things only continues to teach survivors that they won't get help when they ask for it or that people don't care about them uh, we are continuing to per perpetuate rape culture and a culture of violence when we ignore or make excuses for people. Um, being accountable to ourselves and to others is the main key to stopping interpersonal violence. Uh, there's something called an accountability process which can have a lot of problems in it, but basically it, that is when someone who is perpetrating violence agrees to be accountable for their actions and works towards change. Uh, this, this should happen on the, ter the terms of the person they have hurt, the survivor. And sh they shouldn't be allowed to make excuses or be defensive, okay? If you fuck up, making excuses doesn't fix the situation. Saying, oh, well, I mean, they kind of, you know, they're kind of crazy, so, you know, no. Like, we gotta really mean what we say here. If, if someone fucks up, it's about them fucking up. They don't get to blame other people. They don't get to deflect it. People need to be willing to work on themselves and to work um, to, to meet the demands of the people they've hurt and to be held accountable and to help themselves in the process because being an abusive person isn't the way anyone should look with their life. Hurting other people shouldn't be what any of us are striving for. And the FBI informants and everyone else who like to come into this kind of group, like they, they drive on that, you know? They drive on the silence, they drive on people blaming other people for things. And we have to speak up or else we're just helping them out, basically. Um, there are other ways to deal with violence too. There are situations when your community isn't really going to be able to support you, especially not in the way our communities are right now. And sometimes people have to call the police. If someone's banging on your door with a gun, you might not know what else to do, right? But oftentimes the police are very helpful in these situations. I don't know if anyone else has ever been in that situation, but they tend to not really give a fuck when you call them, depending on who you are. And um, we have to. We also have to hold those 
institutions accountable to help out those people, to help the children, and to help other survivors of abuse be advocated for in the court system and to be listened to when they say, hey, somebody's threatening to kill me, can you please do something about this before it's too late? Because oftentimes they are ignored and then it is too late. Um, we need to also advocate for programs that are based on rehabilitation and mental health rather than just allow the prison industrial complex to suck everyone in and make everything worse, basically. Um, lastly, I'd like everyone to really be accountable to look at ourselves and find the will to fight violence in all of its forms and critically assess our own learned behaviors and attitudes. Stop being stuck silent, stop blaming survivors, and look to the others around you and look at what you can do as a person to fight the things that are tearing people around you apart and are hurting ourselves and others around us. And basically, you know, just to say enough is enough. I'm ready to look at me, I'm ready to look at everyone, I'm ready to look at this shit and find something better. So, uh, questions, comments? I really like feedback, especially on the team if anyone gets it. So if anyone wants to give me feedback later or put my email is on here, I really love feedback. So thank you. <laughs>